if you imagine having a balloon, you imagine blowing up that balloon, keep blowing up, there's only a certain amount of plastic and basically the more you blow it up, you know it gets easier to see through because that plastic is getting thinner. What's the same with your eye? Hey everyone, welcome back to STEM Power. My name is Aria Chokshi. And my name is Karen Wang. Joining us today is Dr. Lyndon Jones from the University of Waterloo. So Dr. Jones, thank you so much for joining us on this week's podcast. You're very welcome. Thanks for the uh, invitation. So as uh, Karen briefly mentioned, Dr. Jones is the director at the Center of Ocular Research and Education at the University of Waterloo. Um, It's also known as CORE. So Dr. Jones, would you like to add anything to that? No, that, that's great. Yeah, so CORE has been around uh, initially as the Centre for Contact Lens Research and now as CORE for just over 30 years. Well, we're so excited to have you. And now let's dive right into our questions. So first off, how exactly do contact lenses work? Because not many people really know about that. And how are they different from glasses? Okay, so so obviously glasses sit on your nose. So you've got that big gap between uh, you, the, the back of the specs and your eyes. Um, and the contact lens obviously sits right on the cornea. There are two different types of contact lenses. There are the ones that most people wear. So about 90% of people wear soft lenses. Those are the soft, floppy, flexible ones. And then there are the hard lenses. Um, Hard lenses are are not flexible at all and and certainly take a lot longer to adapt to. And only about 10 percent of people also wear those lenses. And the way in which they work is, is frankly, really just the same as spectacle lenses do in that light comes from a distance. It hits either the spectacle lens or the contact lens. And then depending upon the prescription that you incorporate into that lens, which is based upon there's a little formula called F, which means power equals n dashed minus n, which is the refractive index of air and the refractive index of the material over r the radius. Um, And so basically you can change the power of the lens by changing the shape of the lens. So if you make the lens much more, much steeper, then the lens has a stronger power than if you make it flatter. Wow, so that is super interesting. And um, I know that you briefly mentioned about the different types of contact lenses and that actually segues into our next question. So are there different types of contact lenses for different situations? Now I wear glasses and I also wear contact lenses um, occasionally and I have, I can't see far, so I have myopia. So um, I know that I wear different contact lenses depending on what um, situation I'm in. So are there different types of contact lenses for other things as well? Yeah, great question. So, so you, can, you can divide contact lenses up lots and lots of different ways. So um, the, the first difference is what I just mentioned, which is the soft lenses versus the rigid lenses or the hard lenses. And then within each of those subcategories, there are lots and lots and lots of different materials particularly soft lenses. So as I said, about 90% of people wear soft lenses, so so I'll concentrate on that. When you think about the differences between soft lenses these days, the two main differences are, first of all, the differences between materials, and then secondly, the difference between how frequently they are replaced or thrown away. So if we think about the replacement period, first of all, Most contact lenses that are worn these days are replaced in four weeks or less. So that concept around disposable lenses or frequent replacement lenses started back in the mid 1980s. So just as I was coming into clinical practice, that's when disposable lenses were just starting. Prior to that, people used to wear their lenses for maybe two or three years before they replaced them, which seems quite crazy these days. We've <laughs> yeah. had to do all kinds of heroic things to try and make those, those lenses stay clean. So people used crazy chemistry sets of, of contact lens solutions to keep them clean. Wow. But most people replace them in four weeks or less. So when you go to your optometrist or your contact lens practitioner, you'll typically be prescribed a soft lens that's replaced every four weeks, every two weeks, or every day. Uh, so those would be daily disposables. So that's the frequency of replacement. And then the other big difference to say is really between materials. And you, you, although there are lots of different subtleties that the kind of main breakdown in materials is whether they're the older um, conventional, what we call hydrogel materials or the newer 
silicone hydrogel materials. And the main difference between those two is that the silicone hydrogels have silicone in them and silicone is brilliant at transmitting oxygen. So silicone hydrogels transmit more oxygen than hydrogel lenses. And that's the kind of two main breakdowns. So difference between material and difference between frequency of replacement. Wow, that's pretty interesting. So many types and like so many ways to group them. And um, you see, I have a friend who um, she wears overnight contacts. I I'm not sure if that's what they're called, but like apparently you just put them in at night and you sleep with them on. And then like overnight, I don't know, they like fix your vision. And then the next day you can, you know, see, see perfectly. And um, I was reading a bit about them and apparently like they reshape your cornea. And I was just wondering, um, could you like, talk a bit more about that and like, you know, yes. teach me what it means. Sure, sure. Now that's that's really interesting because that's the other example of contact lens. I mentioned that, that about 90% of people wear soft. That concept of where you take a contact lens and sleep in it overnight to modify the shape of your cornea to eliminate, it. it you can eliminate hyperopia or long sightedness but it's, it's mainly used to correct what you said you've got, Karen, which is myopia or nearsightedness, which is where we struggle to see in the, in the distance. So that particular concept ha has a particular name and it's called orthokeratology. So orthokeratology. And, and what an orthokeratology is, or the short form is, is ortho-K. So, so what an ortho-K lens is, is it's a rigid lens and it's almost exactly the same concept as the sort of retainer that you use for your teeth if you're using oh. braces. So it, it, it's really very similar to that. And so what you do is as a, as a contact lens practitioner, you would carefully measure the shape of the patient's eye. And by knowing what the shape of the patient's eye is, you would know exactly how much myopia or nearsightedness you're trying to get rid of. And so what myopia is, is it's basically where your eye has grown too big for you. So the length of the eye from the front, so from the cornea to the back of the eye to the retina, that physical distance is too long. And so when light comes into your eye, rather than being imaged by the crystalline lens inside your eye, rather than that being imaged on your retina, it's actually focused in front of your retina because your eye is stretched too long. So what you wanna do is if you think about when light hits the cornea and it then gets, gets bent by the cornea and the lens inside your eye to be imaged on your retina, what you wanna do is you wanna actually make that, that the power of your cornea actually less such that light doesn't get imaged in front of your eye, but because the power of that cornea is made to be less, it actually images further back in your eye and lands on your retina. So you take some fancy measurements, you know how much myopia you want to get rid of or, or where you want to divert that light to. So it's imaged on the retina and you make a special shaped contact lens that changes the shape of your cornea to make it weaker. It, less, it has less power and you pop that lens in your eye. It reshapes your cornea overnight. So it's the way when you wake up in the morning and you take off that retainer or ortho K lens, now your eye actually images that, that the light that's entering your eye in the right spot on the retina. So that's what ortho-K is. L literally just like a retainer for your eye. I so actually, overnight contacts, but your yeah. eye retainer, basically. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I'm thinking about like the retainer that I use at night to like make sure my teeth don't, you know. <laughs> identical, I identical concept. If you imagine it's a retainer for your cornea, that's exactly what you're doing. You're, you're reshaping your cornea to effectively eliminate the fact that it's too long in the same way that your retainer in your teeth is there to, uh, to keep your teeth straight. I find that so fascinating because I've actually never heard of um, overnight contact lenses at all. And um, I find that there's like so many options to help fix like any issues with your eyes. So it's great to learn about these things. Now, moving on um, to the next question. Um, so, an I um, do dance and obviously I have to wear contact lenses a lot for that. And during performances, I wear heavy eye makeup and makeup in general. Now, one of the issues I have it, that really scares me when I'm wearing lenses is that um, I sometimes might get little like makeup particles in my contact lenses and then I have to take, to, take them out um, a lot. 
and then put them back in and like clean them a lot. So I wear daily contact lenses. So sometimes I have to take them out, throw them out and then put new ones in because I might've gotten like mascara or something in them. So um, what are some things that we can do to prevent issues related to contact lenses while we're using them? Because I feel like this can be something that many people are concerned about and that's what's restricting them from, you know, trying them out. Well, again, what, what, what a great question. Now, now, in all fairness, my use of uh, mascara is not as probably as much as yours. Uh, <laughs> so, but interestingly, our research group actually have published on the interaction with various eye makeups with contact lens materials. You've actually had two papers. So a contact lens company called Alcon uh, actually asked us a couple of years ago this very question because they were concerned that their contact lens materials um, may be attracting too much. Uh, I think we looked all together at eye make. So uh, see if I can get these things right. So mascara and eyeshadow and um, makeup remover. Yeah, they're frustrating, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, and there was another thing. What else do you put around your eyes? Um, for me, um, I use eyeliner. Uh, oh, that's right. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. That was it. That was. <laughs> I knew there were four things all together. So we, we actually looked at all four of those things. And what this company was particularly interested in was whether there was a difference between the, those two classes of materials that we talked about, the hydrogels and the silicone hydrogels. Now, silicone hydrogels are growing in, um, in usage. Uh, probably about 65% of all people who get fit with soft lenses uh, maybe a little, a little bit more than that now, it's maybe as much as 75% are fitted with silicone hydrogels. Reason being, they transmit more oxygen. They're a, new, a newer family of materials. The downside of silicone hydrogels is that although you get shed loads more oxygen going to your eye, the downside is, is that silicone is actually very hydrophobic. So if you think about where you use silicone in and around your home, you use it to spray on your shoes to make them waterproof. You use it to spray on your coat. You use it to seal up around the bath. So that silicone sealant that you use. So silicone actually hates water. So it means that although we're incorporating silicone into these contact lenses and these contact lenses have to sit in your tears, which are very watery, the extra oxygen that we get through is a plus of silicone hydrogels but the fact that they're hydrophobic and, and, and not very wettable is a downside. So you've got, got to actually play some fairly interesting chemistry games to make silicone hydrogel comfortable when you put them into the tear film. Now, the reason that that's relevant for eye makeup is that most eye makeup is very oily. When you put an oily thing near something that's hydrophobic, you get a lot more take up of that onto the material. So people were worried about the fact that these silicone hydrogels would actually absorb a lot more um, cosmetics. And in fact, some of them do. So there are certain silicone hydrogel materials that actually don't work as well with certain cosmetics as others. And that's why using what you're doing, which is a daily disposable lens that's replaced every day, mm -hmm. actually works best if you're using lots of eye makeup. So, so it sounds like you're already doing you know, what you should be doing. Yeah, because I know that especially when I wear um, makeup in general, like heavy makeup on days where I have performances. Well, this is last year before COVID times, obviously, right now, not many things are open. Yeah, sure. But um, when I used to use eye makeup and I'd put um, mascara or anything on, it always get in my contact lenses, and it would be so um, irritating that I'd have to take them out and then put them back in. And I know that it's really common. It's actually um, better to wear um, your contact lenses before you put on makeup is what I've heard. I'm not Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. That, that's exactly right. Yep. So you, you, so you want to try and avoid having to, if you like, try and put it in when you've got the makeup on, because yeah. that's when it, it tends to get underneath the lens and it tends to spoil the lens. So you, you really need to put your lenses in and then put your makeup on afterwards. Yes, yeah, so that's what I've been trying to do. And I think it worked. But then at the same time, they just like, get dirty again and I have to put them back in. And it's a whole chaotic situation when you have like 20 minutes till you go on stage and <laughs> it's obviously very annoying but yeah, um I no think... way around it sadly <laughs> exactly so um I think that I'll let Karen proceed with her question now um and then we'll go from there okay. yeah um 
yeah, I know. I, it's just really interesting about the makeup, like sticking to the contacts. And, um, you know, a lot of people are preferring to uh, contacts over glasses just for the sake of um, comfort and like, you know, not having these glasses that like slide down your nose in the summer. Yeah. And um, uh, I was it just got me thinking because now that technology is so, so much more accessible and like, you know, uh, kids always want to play ga- video games and like spending their entire days um looking at a screen and obviously it puts it puts uh stress on our eyes right and um well i've heard when you look at screens like too close or too often your like prescription i guess like it goes up and i was just wondering um like since people prefer to have contacts over glasses what age do you normally see people go in and get contacts and um is it bad if kids get contacts at a very young age Oh, now, now you've asked a really cracking great question and, and actually a very topical question. So let, let's so the, there's lots of things you covered in that question. So let, let's back up, first of all, by that concept around does doing lots of screen work and near work actually lead to nearsightedness or myopia? So there, there are there is probably more evidence than there isn't that so. But by that, I mean that this is a very controversial topic. So there are some studies that haven't been able to link the amount of near work with myopia, but there are more studies that have been able to. Okay, so it it depends very much upon um, the genetics of the people, how close they hold it, all, all kinds of things. But if we look at the factors that drive nearsightedness or myopia, first of all, Um, If you look in Asian countries, so if you look in Taiwan, for example, something like 95% of people are nearsighted. 95%. Wow. Yeah, exactly. And and a lot of those also have a very high prescription. It's not even the fact that it's they're nearsighted, but you know, they're minus six units or above. Karen, Karen, do you know what prescription you are? Do you know what numbers are on your contact lens? Um, I'm pretty sure that my left eye is around three and my right okay. eye is like two-ish, I think. Okay, so that's that's moderate levels. So so those so once you start getting six units or above that means that your eye is very stretched it's very long and it means that you're more likely to develop complications later in life if you imagine having a balloon you imagine blowing up that balloon keep blowing up keep, keep, you know, there's only a certain amount of plastic and basically the more you blow it up you know that it gets easier to see through because that plastic is getting thinner what's the same with your eye so Ideally, what you want is you want your numbers to be as low as you can, not just because it's a pain, because when you've got high numbers, you can't see very far, but there is physically less chance of you developing eye complications later in life because your eye is so stretched. Um, And so in in areas of Asia, um, say some some countries, it's as high as 90, 95%. Um, The linkages are very genetically driven we do think that it's driven by the amount of near work and the amount of education that people have um and there there are a host of other things uh, as well but those are certainly very strong risk factors and so we've noticed and, and there have been a couple of papers published now that in recent years as kids have started to do more near work on things like tablets and of course the pandemic has has resulted in more kids being schooled at home so there's a lot more um education being done on tablets and things rather than distance boards as you would get in school that there has been an increase in a couple of papers now reported in young children so that's the first thing is that there does seem to be a link between near work and myopia and the more near work that you do the more likely you are that your numbers are going to get up higher now let's come back to your question about what is the right age to fit kids with contact lenses that there isn't really a an age where you could say yes that's a good age no that's a, a bad age because it really is driven by the individual patient I, i've had kids i might have fit them for example because they're they're high let, let, let's say for example something like hockey you know good hockey player seven eight years old they they can't wear their specs we put them into contact lenses I've had incredibly compliant, well-behaved 
kids at seven and eight who are much or, or are, who I trust to look after the lenses more than a 14 or 15 year old. So it, it's down to really the responsibility and how grown up that kid is as to whether they can really be trusted to wear contact lenses, because it is more risky to wear contact lenses than it is to wear specs. When we look at the typical age that kids get fit with contact lenses, usually it's kind of as they go into their teen years, 11, 12, 13. Um, and we've got pretty good data from around the world that most practitioners are pretty comfortable fitting kids who are 11, 12, 13. Now, I'm gonna mix both of those things up. I'm gonna mix up the myopia and the kids wearing contact lenses now because we are starting to get really good evidence about the fact that you can actually slow the progression of myopia or nearsightedness by fitting specific designs of contact lenses. So my research group, along with many other research groups, have been looking at um, the use of contact lenses, both rigid lenses, so that orthokeratology concept where you take a rigid lens and you sleep in it overnight, as well as daily wear soft lenses that have unique shapes, so they have a unique um, pattern on them, if you like, wow. to, to bend light differently. But those special designs of contact lenses, if you fit them in a kid early enough, they can actually slow the progression of myopia by as much as 50 to 60%. Really? Yep. Wow. So if you take a <laughs> six year old, as their eye is still growing, so, so of course th this only works when your eye is growing. You can, you can only slow that progression of, of myopia if it's when the kid's eye is growing and, and your eye stops growing at around about the age of 14 or 15 or so. So you've got to fit them when they're kind of six to seven in order to slow that progression such that their eventual numbers are less. So someone who might have been six units or eight units or 10 units, you can back that off by about 50% if you fit the kids early enough. Wow. But that's gotta mean that as a practitioner, I'm comfortable fitting those kids with contact lenses and I've gotta be able to trust them and their parents that they will do as I tell them to, because if not, then they may well end up getting an eye infection. Yeah. So one of the biggest growth areas in contact lenses at the moment is what's called myopia management or myopia control, where we use special contact lenses. You can also use special spectacles. Those have come out recently uh, in Canada and also various drugs to slow the progression of myopia. So long answer there, Karen, to what was a, what should have been a simple question, but actually has got a lot of parts to it. No, no, that was, that's really interesting. I've, I've never heard of like anything that could, you know, slow your, your mm -hmm. myopia development down. Yeah. yeah if you, you can look it up on the web. If you look at a, a lens called MySight, M-I-S-I-G-H-T, MySight contact lenses, those are approved in Canada to slow the progression of myopia. And you can also look up, there's, there's a variety of spectacles as well, and also a particular drug called atropine. So atropine, various spectacle lenses, and my sight. You can also look up orthokeratology. So orthokeratology for myopia management or myopia control. You know, I've actually never heard of like myopia um, like management in its sense because I know that when especially my optometrist actually told me that uh, as you're growing my um, number will progress higher mm -hmm. obviously this was when I was younger like around like 10 years old when my number drastically went up during one time from like two to like three and I was like wait a minute mm -hmm. it was actually going pretty well and I could see fine but apparently I couldn't and I never realized it because uh, I guess I would be squinting at the board and I sat pretty in the middle and I would always ask my teacher to put the font of whatever he put on the board a little higher and I never really realized that um, subconsciously I couldn't see properly yeah. <laughs> and that my number had gone up and the same thing happened in seventh grade where I started having headaches and a lot of headaches 
And I didn't realize that that was an issue that my number had gone up again. But now um, I went and I got my eyes checked and it's actually become a lot more stable. It didn't even go up. So I've been wearing the same glasses for around like a year and a half, two years now. Yeah, so Exactly. And that's exactly what happens. So the younger you are, the faster the progression. And then as you get older and just like height, you think about what happens with height. You know, you, mm -hmm. you go through a, a growth spurt when you're, you know, 10, 11, right through until you're about 15, 16. So that's when your, your, um, your body is growing fastest. Your eye grows a little bit quicker than that. So your, your, your eye growth typically tends to start earlier than your, your height growth. Um, but your, your numbers, so when you're in a myopia management program, it's not that your numbers are not going to go up. They, for the majority of people, they still go up, but they go up at a much slower rate. So it slows very... the progression. It doesn't stop it. It just slows the progression of it. That's a really good thing because, I mean, it prevents a lot of people from getting, you know, heavy, like really bad numbers, like 10, 11, you know, exactly. and um, which can cause health issues, I believe, is what you mentioned. Yep. So um, now we're going to move on to a new segment that we wanted to try out. Now, obviously, contact lenses, there's always a truth and a lie. And many people have a lot of myths behind them you know i've heard a few things myself that i really find hard to believe and i think it's time to uncover what's the truth what's the lie so we can figure out what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong so awesome. the first um thing that i wanted to um ask you is that there's a commonly known myth and i've heard this from some of my friends that if you sleep with your contacts in they roll to the back of your eye and this absolutely horrifies me because i mean obviously i've never kept my contact lenses in um before bed because i've always known to take them out um because they're daily contact lenses so you take them out they're not overnight ones so um or even during the day i don't want them to roll to the back of my eye so is that a truth or is that a lie absolutely physically impossible so there is a lining called the conjunctiva and the conjunctiva basically is a sealed off unit on the front of your eye so um, it is physically impossible for anything to get around the back of your eye so um, when you imagine your eyelids close within that within that eyelid space it's a closed pocket so it is impossible. It can roll up underneath your lid. So you, your bottom lid, you, you can always find it because there's less of a gap there. There is more of a gap up underneath your top lid. So a contact lens can displace upwards and it can end up being underneath your lid, but it cannot ever go around the back. Physically impossible. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, honestly, like I go... Um, when I go snowboarding, we have to go really early in the morning and sometimes I get tired. But the thing is, I have to put my contact lenses in beforehand because I don't want to carry my glasses around. And sometimes I'm tired. I'm like, oh, my God, I should just like, you know, take take a bit of a nap. And then I'm like, wait a second. No, I'm my contacts are going to roll to the back of my eye. No, I got to keep away. <laughs> so I guess it's it's a relief that it's physically impossible for that to happen. Physically impossible. Now, now still going to sleep in your lenses is not a good thing. Not not just because of that. Reason. Yes, of course. But if you, I mean, there are lenses that are made, not forget the orthokeratology ones now, that's obviously made specifically for you to sleep in overnight. But there are contact lenses that are licensed for use for you to sleep in overnight. There are three of those um, licensed in Canada. Oh, wow. Um, but, the, but the vast majority of contact lenses are only approved for daily wear. Now, we know that a lot of patients go to sleep in the lenses. Um, probably about 20, 25% of patients will fairly frequently go to sleep in their lenses. And probably twice that number, probably is you know, 50 to 60% of people actually nap in their lens. I bet you've got a lot of people who are listening to this who are contact lens wearers go, oh yeah, you know, before dinner or after dinner or sometime, you know, teenagers in particular, they sleep a lot. True. Sleeping, <laughs> in your, sleeping in your contact lenses is really not a good idea. If you take a contact lens and you wear it on a daily basis and you don't sleep in it, let's say your risk of getting an eye infection is one. If you take that very same lens and you sleep in that lens, the chance of you getting an eye infection 
increases by a factor of 10. So you are 10 times more likely to get an eye infection if you sleep in your contact lens than that very same lens if you don't sleep in it. Oh my goodness. By, by eye infection, we don't just mean a little bit of, you know, a red eye that's a bit, oh, oh, you look like you've slept in your lens today. No, we're talking about a potentially sight threatening eye infection where you can lose vision. Wow, that 10 times? 10 times. And that's been proven time and time and time again. Every single time a study gets done, comes up with the same number. 10 times more likely. I wonder what's more scary, the fact that it can roll to the back of your eye or that you're 10 times more likely to develop an oh, eye infection? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, if it were to roll to the back of your eye, you'd still be able to get it out. If you get really? an eye infection, oh yeah, you, you'd be able to get it out. It, it's, it's actually far more worrying the fact that you can get a hospitalizing eye infection that causes you to lose vision. You only got two eyes. Obviously, I mean, they're super important. You need to see. So Karen, I think you need to stop taking naps with your contact lenses. In. I never take naps <laughs> with my contact lenses. I only uh, said that I feel like I should sleep, but then I'm like, no, I absolutely cannot. Well, for those of our listeners, I think um, whoever does wear contact lenses, please don't sleep with them in. Um, it's very threatening. So I think Dr. Jones really explained that very well. Yeah. Now, Karen, do you want to move on to the next myth? Yeah. Um, okay. This is another really weird one uh, okay. that I heard from my mom. Um, not sure if she's like the most, you know, 100% true contact lens myth person, but you know, basically she says, if you wear contacts and you get too close to a fire or the oven, then your contacts will melt in your eyes. <laughs> and um, I find this very scary, but I'm yeah. not sure if this is true or not. <laughs> Oh, that's a cracker. I've, 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 I have actually heard of that one in all kinds of various formats. So, you know, you get too close to, uh, if, if you're outside and you're playing in the snow, uh, they'll freeze to your eye. If you um, are using, you know, if you're, if you're a welder and you're welding, uh, you can weld them to your eye. If oh, you're what? in somewhere too hot, <laughs> then you can melt them to your eye. Or impossible completely impossible so the the temperature of a contact lens is completely moderated by the environment in which it's in which is basically on the surface of your eye and in the tear film so the tear film that surrounds it so the tears that are on your eye they completely modify the temperature of that so there has never in the history of contact lenses, which came out in the sort of 1880s, ever been a case of a contact lens being melted, frozen, or welded to an eye, ever. Impossible. Honestly, the welding one seems kind of weird. <laughs> the welding one seems like a horrific image to see. Like it's just stuck on your eye. You can't yeah. get it out. It, um, it, it can't. The, the, the plastic cannot melt to your eye. It does not. But that now, makes me you, happy to hear. To, to, to make this a very macabre story, if it was someone wearing a contact lens and they were burned in a fire, that would be different. Yeah, probably. Maybe you probably, probably have more issues than, you know, a yeah. tiny <laughs> contact lens. <laughs> so so a, a body that gets burned, that's, that's different because then the, it's the actual fire itself that's... Uh, that's melting the plastic, but uh, but those other situations, nah, it doesn't happen. That's great to hear. Now, sadly, this is our final question for you. All right. So I think um, our listeners are keen to learn about the ways that we can protect our vision. And obviously you have mentioned this um, in one of Karen's previous questions, but especially during the COVID pandemic, I know that I'll be spending around like five hours a day just trying to finish schoolwork, Mm -hmm. um on google meets you know just looking at my macbook and just trying to get things done but then it's like a habit where subconsciously i'm like okay it's time to, you know rest finish the day i'll go on my phone for a little bit go on social media i'll watch some movie i'll watch some television and i feel like i'm always like on an electronic and i know many people yeah. can relate to this as well so how can we protect our eyes obviously i know limiting screen time is one thing but 
are there any other ways to do such? Yeah, so, th so there's really a couple of different reasons why you want to think about this. One we've kind of talked about already, which is just the amount of screen time that you have could potentially in some situations impact the amount of nearsightedness that you get, so myopia. Uh, we talked about how you can, you can control that. Um, but there are a couple of other things as well. What, one is that just by using your eyes all the time, it doesn't really matter whether it's you know, using your computer or whether you're reading a book all the time, is that your eyes just get tired. So taking a break every now and again is a good idea. There is a, it's called the 20-20-20 rule where you know, about every 20 minutes or so, you should take a 20 second break by looking about 20 feet away. So every 20 minutes or so, just think about Oh, I'm just going to take a break from looking at where I am. It doesn't matter whether it's reading a book, whether you're you know, reading your, your on, on your phone, using your computer, doing whatever. Just take a little break, look into the distance, give your eyes a break for 20 seconds or so. That's just because your eyes get tired generally from being used. Another thing to think about is that whenever we are concentrating on anything up close, is that the number of times that we blink actually drops by about a half. So typically, if you're having a conversation with someone, you blink about 10 to 12 times every minute. And the reason that blinking is important is because those tears that act as a lubricant between the undersurface of your eyelid and the surface of your eye, so the cornea and the conjunctiva, to keep your eye moist and comfortable, uh, needs to be spread out. So you, your, your tears are really complex in terms of where they're produced. And in order for that tear film to be naturally replenished and for you to have a nice layer of lubrication on the front of your eye, you need to blink about every 10 to 12, to about 10 to 12 times a minute. If you're concentrating, you only blink about five to six times a minute. So that means that your eyes dry out. And that's particularly a problem if you're a contact lens wearer, because if you're a contact lens wearer and your eyes dry out, then your contact lenses become uncomfortable. So Agreed. that's another reason why, again, try to take a break just to break your fixation on whatever you're looking at means that you're going to blink less. Uh, you're going to blink more rather um, because you're, you're breaking that uh, fixation. And um, I think that's all the time that we have. But um, just thank you again, Dr. Jones, for taking the time out of your day to speak with us on our podcast. Yes. You are very welcome. And uh, for those of you, those listeners out there who are interested in, uh, in becoming an optometrist, it's a good profession. It's great to be able to... Uh, to deal with people's vision. You'll, you'll always have a job because people always need their eyes examined. Right? <laughs> always. It's, it's great looking after patients. Patients, uh, it's good. Yes, so thank you so much, um, Dr. Jones, again, for um, joining us. And thank you so much to our listeners for listening to this episode of STEM Power with Dr. Jones from the Center of Ocular Research and Education at the University of Waterloo, better known as CORE. So we hope you stay tuned for the next one. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have a great day.